You're fascinated by murders. You love psychology. I mean, you're listening to serial killers, right? So before we start with today's peek into the murderous psychology of the Zodiac Killer, we want to mention a new documentary that comes out on HBO tonight. Mommy Dead and Dearest, a true crime story in the age of social media, where child abuse, mental illness, and forbidden love converge. This mystery tells the story of Dee Dee Blanchard and her wheelchair-bound daughter, Gypsy Rose, a mother and daughter who were beloved members of their community and thought to be living a fairy tale life. But as it turns out, it was actually a living nightmare. Get a first-hand look at this bizarre case and one of psychology's most controversial conditions, Munchausen by Proxy Syndrome, in Mommy Dead and Dearest, premiering Monday, May 15th at 10 p.m. on HBO. Want to support ParCast and get exclusive access to early and ad-free episodes? Check out patreon.com slash ParCast to donate today. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash parcast due to the graphic nature of this killer's crimes listener discretion is advised this episode includes dramatizations and discussions of murder and assault that some people may find offensive we advise extreme caution for children under 13 now enjoy the show what makes a murderer stand out from a sea of killers especially when their body count is relatively low. Some stand out due to the sheer violence of the crimes, the blood, the carnage, the suffering. Others coast on their personalities, suave, slick, or nightmarish. Hello? Hello? <sighs> and some make mysteries of themselves feeding the police and the public just enough information to keep them interested, while keeping enough hidden to avoid a sting. In the late 1960s, the Zodiac kept the press well-fed. What started as a double homicide in a little town in the Bay Area would soon hold Northern California in a grip of fear and intrigue, all because of a little symbol drawn on a car door and a series of letters, the crosshairs of a rifle. Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. Hi, I'm Greg Polson, and this is Serial Killers, a new podcast diving into the minds and motives of the most infamous criminals around. This week, we'll be tackling the Zodiac Killer, the anonymous gunman who carved a path through California's Bay Area in the late 1960s. Not much is known about the man behind the nickname, but we'll unpack his possible motivations and trail of letters he left behind. If you want to listen to any episodes of Serial Killers, you can find them all on your favorite podcast directory or on our website, parcast.com, spelled P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. Don't forget to subscribe because a new episode comes out every Monday. Joining me is my criminal psychology-loving co-host, Vanessa. Though it's important to note Vanessa is not a licensed psychologist or psychiatrist, she has done a lot of research on serial murderers and why they kill. Hi everyone. I know we've been talking about serial killers for a while now, but I think it's about time we cover what officially makes someone a serial killer. To borrow a definition from the FBI, a serial murder is the unlawful killing of two or more victims by the same offender in separate events. Hmm, well that sounds like a catch-all. It has to be. There's no single common motive or developmental factor for a killer, as you may have noticed from the variety of killers we've covered so far. So anyone could be a serial killer? Yes. However, more common personality traits found in serial killers include seeking sensation, lacking remorse, high impulsivity, a need for control, predatory behavior, and psychopathy. That list by no means covers everything. As we've already discussed traits beyond those in earlier episodes, but they're the big ones. Right, we've seen a few of those so far. Let's talk about seeking sensation for a minute. I have a feeling we're not talking about riding roller coasters or going to haunted houses. Ooh, imagine going to a haunted house with a serial killer. Ooh. Terrifying. You're on the right track, though. 
Haunted houses, roller coasters, Swedish massages. Those are things normal people do for sensation or thrills. Serial killers, however, need more. Studies have actually shown that most serial killers have a higher threshold for pain. Now, there aren't that many serial killers around agreeing to participate in scientific research, but there are a fair amount of sociopaths who have agreed to participate in experiments. And most serial killers are sociopaths or psychopaths, correct? Most, but not all. That's important. Again, you can't put all murderers in a neat box. But I bring up sociopathic killers because it's commonly believed the Zodiac was a sociopath. Diagnosed sociopaths and psychopaths have lesions on their brain, which affect, for lack of a better word, their empathy lobe. This leads to unusual responses to stimuli. Let's go back to the high pain threshold of sociopathic serial killers. In one study done with a group of sociopaths and a group of normal people, each participant was asked to move a lever to turn on a light, and then given a surprise electric shock when they touched the lever. The sociopaths all took longer to let go of the lever and end the shock. Mmm, so a slower reaction time. Not slower. They just needed to be shocked for longer before it became uncomfortable. Sociopathic serial killers need more stimulation to elicit a response. That's why they seek more sensation than a non-killer. Mm-hmm, I see. Another factor is that serial killers feel less fear and anxiety than the average person. A study done at UW-Madison in 2010 found that the lack of fear in psychopaths is due to an attention deficit disorder which keeps them from recognizing so-called scary situations when there's a lot going on. That's why many killers don't feel uncomfortable watching someone die. So serial killers have ADD? Not ADD exactly, but a similar issue. Mm -hmm. So perhaps the Zodiac Killer didn't process fear normally. I think so, based on the fact that he was a thrill killer. Thrill killer? <laughs> now that sounds like a roller coaster. Trust me, it's not. But let's go through some background on the Zodiac and come back to it. Okay. San Francisco. Travel back with us to the inspiration behind Dirty Harry's Scorpio Killer. This is The Zodiac. When we think of a serial killer, more often than not, we're going to conjure up two men. The charismatic psychopath or the withdrawn, sullen loner. The Zodiac Killer was a curious mix of both. He was arrogant, brash, but the mocking letters to the newspapers he became famous for were littered with spelling and syntax errors. Some were nearly illegible. But every storied career has to have its start. Before the alleged killer called into the morning show, he had attacked seven people, murdering five. From December 1968 to October 1969, the Zodiac prowled the Bay Area. The Zodiac spree is officially recorded as starting on December 20th, 1968, with the murder of two teenagers on Lake Herman Road in Benicia, a city in Northern California. The first letter would be sent to the San Francisco Chronicle seven months later, on July 1st, 1969. He sent 22 verified letters to various newspapers only ending in 1974. Many of us can imagine objectively what would drive a person to kill, and kill repeatedly. They're sick, they're evil, they are in some way unwell and abnormal. A successful serial killer is a relatively rare feat, so they must be anomalies. Yeah, but what motivates them? Even senseless killing follows the most basic pattern. During an FBI symposium on crime, they agreed that a serial killer could most likely have the following motivations. Monetary, sexual gratification, ideological drive, or the most common, rage. When someone claiming the Zodiac title called into KGO, the safest assumption to make was rage. The caller yelled that he wanted to kill kids. Oh yeah, that last bit through the police. It was in relation to the seventh letter the Zodiac sent to the press. School children make nice targets. I think I shall wipe out a school bus some morning. Just shoot out the front tire and then pick off the kitties as they come bouncing out. As a parent, that is absolutely horrifying to think that someone would go after your child. So do serial killers target children frequently? Sadly, yes. A common trait amongst most victims is vulnerability. 
You wouldn't attack someone who could easily overpower you, so a killer would rely on either the element of surprise or incapacitation. Children, young adults, women, and the elderly are common targets. Hmm, it's unfortunate, but not shocking. It's the letter that's shocking. Thankfully, he didn't carry out the plan and only gave the public a terrifying idea. Yeah. Well, do you think it was intentional? I mean, would a man such as the Zodiac strive for shock factor? Even negative attention is still attention for someone craving it. The Zodiac's goal with the ciphers and letters was to keep people talking about him. Threatening outlandish things means constant free space in every major newspaper. Textbook example, Donald Trump's presidential campaign last year. He'd say something polarizing, it'd make national news, boom, free campaign advertising. And clearly it worked. I mean, the man's president. The Zodiac just used that same technique of media manipulation for mass terrorism. And it was uncomfortably effective. After the Zodiac's second confirmed attack in Vallejo, California, he threatened to kill more for continued media attention. Dear editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. In answer to your asking for more details about the good times I have had in Vallejo, I shall be very happy to supply even more material. By the way, are the police having a good time with the code? If not, tell them to cheer up. When they do crack the code, they will have me. It was after his final murder that he began toying with, not just the police and the media, but the citizens of San Francisco. This would fit into his obsessive need for media attention. Holding a city in constant fear keeps your name relevant. Many killers seem to love the spotlight. The Los Angeles Night Stalker reportedly told a victim, you know who I am, don't you? I'm the one they're writing about in the newspapers and on TV. And let's not even go into Ted Bundy. Right. We've already covered Bundy's use of the spotlight in previous episodes. The idea is, narcissistic killers want to become celebrities. That's where you get copycat killers. An example of this desire is when the Zodiac demanded the entire city wear buttons with the Zodiac symbol on them. But that's a ways down the line. We'll come back to it. The Zodiac Killer may have been impossible to track down, but what you're looking for doesn't have to be. With Tile, you can find anything in seconds. Tile is a tiny Bluetooth tracker you can attach to your keys, your laptop, your bike, even your kid's homework folder. Whatever you're spending too long tracking down. Finding your things is easy. Just open the free Tile app on your phone to see your lost item on the map. Then quickly find your item by making your Tile ring, and it'll be back in your hands in seconds. And if it's your phone that's missing, just double press on your tile to make your phone ring, even on silent. Ooh, that's good. Good? It's miraculous. Get yours today at gettile.com slash cereal and save up to 30% per tile on a multi-pack, plus free shipping. And because tile makes the perfect gift, for a limited time, get a free gift box with a multi-pack order. Go to gettile.com slash cereal. That's G-E-T-T-I-L-E dot com slash S-E-R-I-A-L. Gettile.com slash cereal. You know what I'm looking for? What to cook for dinner tonight. Well, you should try Blue Apron. Blue Apron makes incredible home cooking easy and accessible by delivering seasonal recipes with step-by-step -step instructions and pre-portioned ingredients right to your door. And look at these meals. Oh, wow. Share them with our listeners. Okay. Some of the meals available in May include beef teriyaki stir-fry with sugar snap peas and lime rice, baked spinach and egg flatbread with sautéed asparagus and lemon aioli, three cheese and baby broccoli stromboli, mm, with tomato and oregano dipping sauce, and crispy salmon and roasted potato salad with pickled mustard seeds and creme fraiche sauce. With Blue Apron, you look at your dinner and think, what, I made this? No way, it looks and smells like it came from a fine restaurant. And for less than $10, I must be going crazy. And then you eat it, 
and it's just as tasty as it looks and smells. So check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash killers. You'll love how good it feels and tastes to create incredible home-cooked meals with Blue Apron, so don't wait. That's blueapron.com slash killers. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Before we continue, let's put together a timeline. This will come in handy. December 1968. Zodiac kills two teenagers in Benicia, a small town in the North Bay Area. Fourth of July, 1969, he shoots two people in Vallejo, California, killing one. September 1969, he stabs two college co-eds at a park at Lake Berryessa, near Napa, California, killing one. And then finally, October 1969, his final shoot. Cab driver Paul Stein was shot once in the head, killing him instantly. Then he was robbed of his wallet and cab keys, and a piece of his shirt was ripped away. Though the Zodiac normally chose his victims in isolated areas where he was unlikely to be disturbed, he broke his pattern here. This is an example of the fearlessness we discussed at the beginning of the episode. Killing in sight of others on a public street. Well, a normal person would go crazy with fear just thinking about getting caught by the police. But the Zodiac, according to witnesses, was eerily calm. He even took the time to clean up his mess before he walked away. That's bold. So why would he switch up his M.O. after killing so many? It isn't uncommon for killers to adapt their M.O., that is, modus operandi, or mode of operation, to fit their crime scenes and circumstances. According to Psychology Today, an M.O. is simply a learned behavior that is subject to change. His attacks all took place on different terrains, with varying levels of seclusion. It would make sense he adjusted to fit each situation, and perhaps shooting couples in the middle of nowhere wasn't providing the same level of excitement for him as it used to. He needed to do something different to get the same thrill, like a drug addict taking a bigger dose every time to get the same high. Anything else that might cause a regimented killer to change paths? Hmm, necessity. Even the BTK killer, with his infamous MO, Bind, Torture, Kill, adjusted to fit each situation. And in this case, the change in MO was risky. Three teenagers witnessed Paul's murder in the cab, and then they phoned police while they watched the murderer rifle through the victim's pockets. But help came entirely too late. <laughs> the Zodiac was able to wipe down the cab before the police even arrived, and the teenagers watched him stroll calmly away from the murder scene. In one of his letters after the murder, the killer says that a policeman walked right by him mere minutes after the crime, when the police started their manhunt. Whether this was true or just a way to needle the police, it was never confirmed. But the San Francisco Police Department does admit to bungling the crime scene. First responder Officer Folk saw a Caucasian man walking by the crime scene, but didn't stop to question him, as dispatchers told them to be on the lookout for an African-American man. No one is entirely certain which wires got crossed, and why the dispatcher was so incorrect but the police never stopped the man, despite walking through an active crime scene. And a search found nothing. No one was picked up off the street that night. The police were left with only descriptions given by the three young witnesses. Would you say his jaw was like this or more round? Round. Was he overweight? Maybe a little? Yes. No. Did he have any other identifying marks? Glasses. He was wearing glasses. Style? Shape? I don't know. It was dark. Square, I think. They were able to come up with a composite sketch, but a few days later, they revised it. It's never been clear whether the revisions were made because of the local teens recalled more information, or to match a description of the Caucasian man at the crime scene given by Officer Donald Folk. In any case, the side-by-side -side images gained infamy, and Detective Dave Toshi and his partner Bill Armstrong were put on the Zodiac's heels and would stay on the case until Toshi's retirement from the SFPD. Armstrong and Toshi took the composite and set out in search of the criminal. Spoiler, they didn't have much luck. While his composite was driving the SFPD, the San Francisco Chronicle, one of the Bay's biggest newspapers, was a frequent target for his manifestos. 
A letter for the editor. Oh my god. If the police were baffled by the Paul Stein murder, they would be taunted by it a few short days later. Call Toshi. Call somebody. The Zodiac wrote his second letter to the San Francisco Chronicle, the first to the newspaper using his new moniker. The police were very interested in one passage in particular. This is the Zodiac speaking. I am the murderer of the taxi driver over by Washington Street and Maple Street last night. To prove this, here is a blood-stained piece of his shirt. I am the same man who did in the people in the North Bay area. Along with the letter, the killer included a bloody scrap of fabric the police were able to confirm belonged to Paul Stein's shirt. A souvenir from the crime scene. Ugh. What type of killer takes souvenirs from his victims? Actually, souvenirs are common among killers. This isn't an extraordinary measure. All a killer needs is the desire to relive the moment and adequate time to collect it. They can range from a driver's license to the victim's severed head. What's more interesting is why the Zodiac would give away his souvenir. Okay, I'll bite. Why would he give away his souvenir? Attention, spectacle, publicity. The desire to get more attention from the Chronicle most likely outweighed the Zodiac's desire to relive his crimes. He had to one-up the letters he'd been sending to maintain relevancy. In a way, his letters were his souvenirs. Mm, and speaking of the letters, for obvious reasons, Toshi and Armstrong were called in immediately to inspect the letter and the shirt. We're having it dusted for prints. Something's bound to turn up. It didn't. Five letters, three newspapers, not one usable print. Well, we worked with less before. But how is it possible he could have written several handwritten letters without leaving behind any viable physical evidence? A thumbprint was found on Paul Stein's cab, but it yielded no results. The Zodiac was either the luckiest man in San Francisco or the most meticulous. Both are equally dangerous. And terrifying, for different reasons. Little is known about the man hiding behind the crosshair symbol, but the SFPD were able to piece together a profile of a narcissistic, self-aggrandizing killer. Dr. Lawrence Friedman from the Institute of Social and Behavioral Pathology at the University of Chicago studied the Zodiac's killing pattern, particularly his attacks on couples. Friedman said, He has struck out in savage rage against those who seem to flaunt an intimacy that he craves with an intensity which only the fantasy of the deeply frustrated human being can imagine. End quote. Friedman also said, quote, He spreads terror because he leads a terror-dominated life, and he insists on his power because he feels powerless. End quote. And that terror was spread through slayings and letters. Yes, back to the letters. One thing we can examine from the letters is the graphology. Now, the study of handwriting isn't the most trusted form of science, but it's what we've got in the way of clues to the zodiac psyche, so we're going to talk about it. Handwriting analysis expert William Baker studied the letters and ciphers the Zodiac sent, and his conclusion mirrored much of what the SFPD suspected. The Zodiac was a bitter man with an unhappy life who wanted to punish the world for it. Baker said, quote, The strong slant to the left of the lower letters denotes a mother hostility and an unhappy childhood. Carry that trait further and you find the man who is afraid of women and hates them. Carry that to the further extreme, and you have a man who is capable of killing women to get even with his mother. End quote. Hmm. His mother or his mother and father? Paul Stein is the only confirmed victim to have been a single target. In the four crime scenes, he attacked three couples, David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen on Lake Herman Road, Michael Renaud Majot and Darlene Farron in Vallejo, and Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Ann Shepard at Lake Berryessa. Could he have psychologically been going after both parents? Dr. Friedman had this to say, quote, to those who gave him being but denied him affection or recognition, he is saying, however insanely, look at what you have done to me, end quote. Of all the couples attacked, Michael Majot and Brian Hartnell managed to survive. None of the women were so lucky. On top of intimacy issues, some psychologists and experts have pondered just how deep his hatred of women extended. Could there be an underlying current of misogyny in the crimes, or is it simply correlation that most of the men managed to survive? 
Well, the Zodiac's victims are too varied to prove misogyny or explicit targeting. It's simply more likely his female victims were hit in more vital areas than their male companions. While the Zodiac very well could have been a lonely, frightened mother's boy, his anger and violent, explicit fantasies suggest someone much more dangerous. Take, for example, his second murder. <laughs> On the 4th of July, 1969, the Zodiac walked up to a car and blinded Michael Majot and Darlene Farron with a flashlight before firing into the car several times. Michael survived, but Darlene wasn't so lucky. She died at the hospital. And a mere two minutes after Darlene passed at the hospital, the Vallejo Police Department received a call Nancy Slover, Vallejo Police Dispatcher, answered the call. Vallejo Police Department, how may I direct your call? I want to report a murder. If you go one mile east on Columbus Parkway, you will find kids in a brown car. They were shot with a 9mm Luger. I also killed those kids last year. Goodbye. Nancy described the voice as monotone and unemotional like the killer was reading a prepared statement. But that phone call proved credible enough to link the murder in Vallejo with the December slaying in 1968. So why did he kill? In his own words, I like killing people because it is so much fun. It is more fun than killing wild game in the forest because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill something gives me the most thrilling experience. It is even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. Another motive comes up in his ciphers. The best part of it is that when I die, I will be reborn in paradise, and all them I have killed will become my slaves. I will not give you my name because you will try to slow down or stop my collecting of slaves for my afterlife. The themes of paradise and slaves crop up more than once in the Zodiac's letters. In a Halloween card mailed to Chronicle crime reporter Paul Avery a year after Paul Stein's murder, the killer opened the letter with one and two word sentences. Paradise. Slaves. By fire by gun, by knife, by rope. I shall, on top of everything else, torture all 13 of my slaves that I have waiting for me in paradise. Some I shall tie over anthills and watch them scream and twitch and squirm. Others shall have pine splinters driven under their nails and then burned. Yes, I shall have great fun inflicting the most delicious of pain to my slaves. Paradise. Slaves? That sounds almost biblical. That's an interesting influence to consider, though we can't go too far with it. So is it possible the Zodiac could have had a god complex? Not really. A so-called god complex doesn't have a medical equivalent but the extreme arrogance could suggest narcissistic personality disorder, which is in line with the police profile. So besides arrogance, what are the other hallmarks of narcissistic personality disorder? Anything exhibited by the Zodiac? According to the DSM-5, symptoms include an extreme lack of empathy, a driving need for admiration, self-confidence beyond any normal marker. Basically, they believe they are superior to everyone around them and expect to be treated as such. They have fantasies of power and success and exploit others for their own gain. Huh. And all of those come out in that last letter. Hmm. <laughs> Narcissism is also evident in the Zodiac's constant need for validation and claim that he killed 37 people. Diagnosed narcissists often exaggerate their own achievements. They are the smartest, the fastest, the coolest. No one else is on their intellectual level, and so they have no equals or peers. In the Zodiac's case, they only have slaves. And perhaps that superiority led him to believe that his victims didn't deserve to live like him. Perhaps. Whether his motive was having fun, gaining slaves, or feeding narcissism, the Zodiac proved clever enough to keep his movements random. 
As Billy Loomis told Sidney in Scream, the scariest motive of all is to not have one. A killer with no discernible pattern or drive is difficult to predict and almost impossible to prevent. This is the Zodiac speaking. Up to the end of October, I have killed seven people. I have grown rather angry with the police for their telling lies about me. So I shall change the way the collecting of slaves. I shall no longer announce to anyone. When I commit my murders, they shall look like routine robberies. Killings of anger and a few fake accidents, etc. The police shall never catch me, because I have been too clever for them. All killers think they can outsmart people hunting them, but in the Zodiac's case, he actually did. None of his letters were traced back to him. But for as smart as he believed himself to be, he lets hints of insecurity out through his mocking. Several times he expresses disappointment that the people of San Francisco are not revering him, such as when they refuse to wear crosshair buttons on their lapels. No plea was as explicit as his November 8th, 1969 letter to the Chronicle. P.S. Could you print this new cipher on your front page? I get awfully lonely when I am ignored. So lonely, I could do my thing. Someone who craves infamy, who craves attention, could lash out in different ways to achieve it. For example, killers with a demonstrably difficult childhood tend to skew more sadistic. Take Otis Toole, a killer and cannibal who struck the South just a few years after the Zodiac Spreant. Born into an abusive family, riddled with sexual and physical abuse, Otis fell into the orbit of equally sadistic Henry Lee Lucas, and a serial killing duo was born. They became known for their brutality, though neither bothered to hide their identities like the Zodiac had. Lucas bragged about hundreds of murders. However, we think he only killed 11. Only? Whew, what a relative term. My point was, Lucas and Toole exhibited extreme narcissism, but didn't hide their identities the way the Zodiac had. What are the chances the Zodiac was actually a deeply insecure person? Yeah, well, his letters are riddled with pleas for attention, particularly his later ones. Once his notoriety had waned, he demanded citizens wear Zodiac buttons and complained bitterly when no one did. For all his talk of superiority, he needed approval desperately. Going back to anger at his parents, could neglect as a child drive the constant need for validation? Children are dependent on caretakers to survive and almost immediately learn what will get them noticed. To emotionally or physically neglect a child triggers their survival instinct. According to Psych Central, children will often resort to negative behaviors as a last-ditch attempt to trigger any sort of attention from their guardians. Killing could be the most extreme version of this need. In cases where a criminal commits crimes for validation or to be noticed, could proper therapy have curtailed their urges? Although therapy is never a bad thing and helps many people, some of the most famous serial killers came from terrible home environments. It's much more likely that having something that negative warp your worldview will influence the rest of your life. That's what we think happened to Otis Toole. It's a popular explanation for his behavior. The Zodiac was also like Henry Lee Lucas. Both inflated their kill counts by an absurd amount. The Zodiac is officially responsible for five deaths, but took credit for killing 37. Many of the deaths were completely fabricated, without a shred of evidence to back up his claims. The San Francisco Police Department did not take his claims seriously, but it didn't deter him from inflating the body count in each subsequent communication. He may have actually been a compulsive liar. Oh, really? So, well, what are the hallmarks of a compulsive liar? Well, constant exaggeration or making up of events in the liar's life, um, outlandish and delusional stories, and conviction. A compulsive liar might know they're fabricating stories, or they can start to truly believe their own lies. Hmm. What do you think are the underlying triggers for compulsive lying? Compulsive liars lie to put themselves in a favorable light. There are a myriad of triggers, as compulsive lying is a symptom of many personality disorders. 
such as psychopathy and borderline personality disorder. Compulsive liars often admit to guilt after lying, which separates them from psychopaths who have no capacity for guilt. Compulsive liars disproportionately come from chaotic or stressful domestic lives. Lying, in this case, may have started as a survival instinct, and it ended, as far as we know, in 1974, when the last letter was received. His murder spree had ended in 1970, but it would be years later before he completely faded from the news. In fact, I could argue he still hasn't completely faded. His name crops up from time to time, most often because someone is convinced their odd father was behind the mask. Seven targeted with five victims. Despite eyewitness testimony, no man was ever brought up in charges. No suspect to study, but we do have a rudimentary psych profile, with all the signs pointing to a man with no capacity for empathy, but enough arrogance to boast of his crimes directly to the police. We're left with an angry, anonymous man sending angry, anonymous letters. And speaking of... Dear Melvin, this is the Zodiac speaking. I wish you a happy Christmas. One thing I ask of you is this. Please help me. Thank you for listening to Serial Killers. Be sure to join us next Monday as we conclude our look into the Zodiac Killer. We'll be taking a look at the Zodiac's ciphers, his victim profile, and telephone confessions from the real Zodiac, as well as imposters. If you enjoyed this episode, please tell your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to Serial Killers on iTunes, Google Play, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or any other podcast directory. Or through our website, parcast.com. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T dot com. A new episode of Serial Killers comes out every Monday. Please let us know what you think and join the conversation on our Parcast Facebook page. You can tweet us at Parcast Network. That's P-A-R-C-A-S-T Network. Have a killer week. Serial Killers was created by Max Cutler and developed by Ron Cutler. It's a production of Cutler Media and is part of the Parcast Network. It's produced by Max and Ron Cutler. Sound design by Ron Shapiro with production assistance by Joel Stein and Maggie Admire. Serial Killers is written by Samantha Gurash and stars Greg Polson and Vanessa Richardson. The amazing cast of voice actors includes, by alphabetical order, Jerry Courtney Austin, Mike Capozzi, Nicholas Masu, Manu Narayan, and Steve Pinto. Stop wasting time looking for your lost stuff when you could be listening to exciting episodes of your favorite psychological true crime podcast. Simply protect the things you use most with Tile, the convenient tiny Bluetooth tracker. Attach Tile to anything you don't want to lose, from your keys to your wallet and even your bike. Then use the free Tile app to help locate your missing items. Act now to get free shipping and save 30% per Tile on a multi-pack. And for a limited time, get a free gift box. Go to gettile.com slash cereal. That's gettile.com slash cereal.